Welcome everyone to lecture 10 of this series. This series of lecture explain my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte in Acid-Based Disorders, a pathophysiologic approach to common clinical problems. You can consider it as a companion to the actual book. I'm Dr. Muhammad Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon as an e e-copy, e-book, or a paperback. We are still on chapter one, disorders of water balance, hyponatremia and hypernatremia. This is part two of hypernatremia. If you have not watched part one, maybe you would want to watch that first and then start this lecture. I'm going to summarize what we talked about regarding correction of hypernatremia. First, we calculate water deficit. Water deficit is current total body water, and we multiply that by current serum sodium divided by 140 minus 1. Then we add this water deficit to insensible water loss, which is about 0 0.8 per uh, liter per day, 0 0.8 liter per day, plus electrolyte free water clearance. We talked about that previously and how to calculate it. And with these three components, we reach the volume of water needed to be replaced. Now, if we want to look at that differently, we can define the desired serum sodium. Let's say that we have a serum sodium of 160 and we want to lower it to 150. How much water we need, then we use the second equation on the screen, current sodium minus desired sodium divided by 140 times current total body water. And then this same amount we need also to add to insensible water loss and electrolyte free water clearance, the same way we did it uh, for uh, the first equation. The difference is uh, we can determine right away with the second equation how much water we need to give today versus the total volume, and then we divide that up. Let's talk now about water deprivation test. This test is time consuming. You need a specialist on the case, a nephrologist or an endocrinologist. It's not done very often. It requires hospitalization, at least observation. And we usually do it if we're not sure about the cause of the hypernatremia, especially if we're suspecting central DI, complete central DI. Usually urine osmolality is below 100 and we have severe polyuria. So uh, patients are kept NPO, and again, this is why you need hospitalization. You don't want to dehydrate the patient so much. You don't want hypotension. So you have to be very careful. Uh, what we do, we measure and record urine volume and body weight hourly on admission. We check urine osmolality, serum sodium, and serum osmolality. Then we check urine osmolality every hour on the hour while we check serum sodium and serum osmolality every two hours. If you are practicing medicine on a, any medical floor, you can see how a nightmare this is going to be, okay? The collection, the lab, mixing up the samples. So good luck. Anyway, so once serum sodium is above 145 and serum osmolality is above 200, okay? What we do, we check the level of vasopressin. We measure vasopressin. And then uh, we give sub subcutaneous injection of aqueous vasopressin, uh, five units. Now, sometimes it's not possible to measure the level of vasopressin, and you can skip that. But uh, you still have to give uh, five units of aqueous vasopressin subcutaneously. Some use desmopressin 2 to 4 microgram IV or subcutaneously instead of aqueous vasopressin because it's readily available. Some people use 3% saline to achieve the desired rise in serum sodium and serum osmolality sooner. And uh, some patients presents already with hypernatremia, serum sodium above 145, serum osm above 300. In that case, we don't need to do anything. Just uh, measure vasopressin and give aqueous vasopressin, and uh, then you're pretty much done. Now, look at this graph, and let's look at different possibilities. Now, in the dark blue uh, with the tag normal, this is what happens if you're doing the test on a patient with no diabetes insipidus, no primary polydipsia, normal patient. 
normal person. The uh, urine osmolality is going to rise. After four hours, it's going to plateau and stay up. And when you give aqueous vasopressin, well, nothing's going to happen, okay, because vasopressin level is maximized already. So the graph in a normal person is clearly different from all the other conditions below. Nephrogenic DI, now this is in the purple, the lowermost graph. What's going to happen is pretty much nothing. Urine osmolality is not going to rise much, if at all. And when we give aqueous vasopressin, nothing's going to happen because of the resistance of the collecting tubule to vasopressin. Now, in central DI, you get the same response like nephrogenic DI initially, minimal rise in urine osmolality. But when you give vasopressin or desmopressin, urine osmolality is going to rise. And this is what you see in the graph, the light, light blue graph. Now, the rise is not going to be the same like in a normal person, but you could go from a urine osm of about 100 to 400, 500. Now, what remains to be differentiated is partial central diabetes insipidus from primary polydipsia. With partial central diabetes insipidus, urine osmolality starts to rise with water deprivation. Now, urine osmolality is not going to reach the normal level, so you could reach maybe 400, 500. When you give aqueous vasopressin, it's going to rise further, but still not to the normal range. While in primary polydipsia, urine osmolality rises, and when you give aqueous vasopressin, nothing happens. Now, I have to say again that usually with primary polydipsia, you're going to see hyponatremia, not hypernatremia, meaning the person drinks water first and they drop their sodium. Now, um, it could be dangerous to do a water deprivation test in someone with primary polydipsia because when you uh, water restrict them, they start diuresing and that could result in very rapid correction of their hyponatremia. So if you know that this is what's going on, I don't see any reason in the world to do a water deprivation test. So what about management of hyponatremia? The traditional view has been to do slow correction, no more than 12 milliequivalents per liter per day. And for that purpose, we use a hypotonic solution, either D5W or 0.45 saline. Usually we use D5W. We use half normal saline if the patient is very hyperglycemic or if you want to support the circulation, they're a little bit hypotensive, so you use 0.45 normal saline. What do you do if you get someone who's hypernatremic and hypotensive? Well, supporting blood pressure takes priority. So you give isotonic saline, even though the patient is hypernatremic, still the, the uh, isotonic saline has 154 uh, milk equivalent per liter of sodium, which is lower than the patient's sodium. You support the circulation first, and then you worry about correcting hypernatremia. So the traditional view has been to correct uh, hypernatremia by no more than 12 milk equivalent uh, per liter per day until this article uh, published in uh, 2019 in a prestigious journal, Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. And the title of the article was Rate of Correction of Hypernatremia and Health Outcomes in Critically Ill Patients. This was a challenge to the uh, usual view, to the traditional view. This was a retrospective study, single central study, in 449 critically ill patients. All of them had hypernatremia. The definition used was serum sodium over 155. So this is pretty high because hypernatremia is defined over 145. So they truly had significant hypernatremia. And Patients uh, were corrected at different rates, depending on the attending, the situation. Rapid correction was more than 12 mole equivalent per, per liter per day or 0.5 per hour, and slow correction less than that, less than 12. Now, 
there was really no difference. In, in either group, uh, no patient developed seizures, cerebral edema, altered consciousness, mortality was not different. So the study said, okay, this 12 uh, mil equivalent per liter per 24 hours really has no, no basis. And if uh, uh, we go faster, um, then no nothing's going to happen. Now, the studies doesn't tell us uh, how fast we can go. It doesn't tell us that 18 is okay or 20 is okay. But maybe we shouldn't be as strict as we used to be. The study also did not report on the type of intravenous fluids used. Did they use 0.45 saline? Did they use uh, D5W? Did they use 0.9, uh, 0.2 saline in D5? We don't know. Uh, the study was accompanied by editorial uh, by uh, Dr. Stern, who is an authority on uh, the, the subject of uh, dysnatremias. And he emphasized that hypernatremia is not hyponatremia in reverse because adaptation to hyponatremia is more rapid. And he said that the current recommendations are based on pediatric studies, not adult studies and a daily correction rate of less than 12, I can conclude, this is my con conclusion, less than 12 is prudent, but not based on clinical trials. Unless, until we have more information, I don't recommend going much uh, faster than 12 because you really don't need to. But if you do, probably you don't need to do anything. Okay, you don't need to give them saline or try to raise sodium. So, um, let's take a few examples. We have someone with a serum sodium of 160. Total volume of water needed is 6. So, what do we do? Uh, so, this 6 liters is water deficit plus insensible loss plus electrolyte-free water. And uh, in that case, uh, we, we say let's correct the first 3 liters in the first 24 hours. So, we'll give 125 ml of D5W per hour. And then the rest we correct over 48 to 72 hours. We'll check serum sodium every six hours. Uh, the next day we reevaluate everything. We define a new target and so forth. In two, three days, uh, this uh, hypernatremia should be corrected. Now, what about patients with hypervolemic hyponatremia? Again, this is not common, but you see it. Someone in the ICU, their volume overloaded, but yet hypernatremic. Someone with CHF, you gave them loop diuretics, they're still fluid overloaded, but they're starting to get hypernatremic. What do you do? You continue the loop diuretic because they need it, uh, but you give D5W. And the idea is here, again, we said we have too much water and we have too much sodium, but more sodium than water. What we want to create with the D5W and loop diuretic combination is a negative balance of sodium that exceeds the negative balance of water and in two three days you will achieve that. What about patients with central diabetes insipidus? Well those you treat with desmopressin. Uh, nephrogenic DI you treat the underlying cause so if they're on lithium maybe you need to find an alternative. If they're hypokalemic well by all means correct the low potassium. If they're hypercalcemic well treat the high calcium. Um, if it is idiopathic, maybe uh, you can consider giving a, a thiazide diuretic. And uh, this concludes uh, hypernatremia. In the uh, next lecture, we're going uh, to uh, present cases and do case studies in both hyponatremia and hypernatremia. See you in lecture 11.